Hi, I'm Lydia Lunning. I'm Morgan McBride. And I'm Michelle Olivier, and you're listening to Hey, I Want Your Job. A look behind the curtain at amazing jobs and what it takes to get them. Good morning and welcome to Hey, I Want Your Job. Today, we have the fabulous Melissa uh, with us uh, to talk about life as a headhunter, one of the most, I think, shrouded in mystery, misconceptions, and all kinds of fabulous lore jobs that I personally know of. The things I have had clients tell me that headhunters do and don't do are amazing, so I'm excited to have an actual headhunter here to answer some of that. So we're going to get to know uh, Melissa and talk about her and how she got there. So let's start with Melissa. What is your actual job title at the moment? Uh, hey, um, so I just I do call myself a headhunter. Um, you know, the, the the kinder term sometimes is recruiter, but I like headhunter. It's a fun term. I always liked it, but I think <laughs> it's one of those like I've known people who are like, don't call us headhunters, like. I, and I don't understand like the, the vitriol against being a headhunter at all. So yeah. I am glad to see somebody embracing it. I have, you know, images of like loincloths and, you know, I, right. I think it's fun. So, okay, so you are a, an independent headhunter. So what does that mean, the independent part? How does, what does that work? How does that work? What does it mean? Sure. Um, so I did work for a company for a couple of years and then I j just recently went independent. Um, and the reason I went independent is because I thought um, I saw the opportunity to make uh, the process a little bit um, less stressful on certain clients and even candidates. Um, the only person I really have to uh, answer to right now is myself. I know some recruiting companies and this is why it can get to be um, a tough industry with a lot of mystery and even a bad name around it is because some recruiting companies are so forceful and pushy and uh, I'm not that at all. And that's not the kind of recruiter or headhunter that I want to be. Cool. So, yeah, so I just, you know, I I'm happy to help companies and clients find the right person for the jobs, but I'm not going to shove a hundred resumes down their throats. I'm just going to find who I think is a good fit. So, and, and that's, you know, that's why I love being independent because I get to make that choice. You know, I think for me, as a, as in my vast at this point, because I'm so old, and some days I'm older than others, Melissa, but um, in my experience in recruitment, I find that with headhunters in particular, I've my experience is that they fall into a couple of different camps, and that some of them are um, the people who have all of the talent in an industry. So, like, I'm thinking uh, people I've known who are, like, chef recruiters and that sort of thing, like, they have the top 50 chefs in their back pocket. If you want to hire one of them, you are going to call this independent headhunter and, you know, good luck. And they're going to charge you whatever they decide to charge you. And then there are another camp that is very client centered and focused. And so they work with clients and then they just go forth and, and, and hunt uh, for exactly the talent that matches there. It sounds like you're more of that second camp that you're sort of client based. Yeah, that. exactly. Yeah, because and, and I do focus a little bit on the insurance industry, but I'm okay. trying to get into um, a few other markets. Um, but yeah, I, I have the client that says, this is what I need. Can you go find them? So yeah, I'm and that's where hunting comes from, right? You go look for that that candidate that they need. So when you are doing the hunting, I think that one of the things that annoys me about promises that I see for products on LinkedIn all the time is have recruiters calling you. If your CV is, if your resume is working for you, you should never contact a recruiter. Obviously ridiculous. Right. Um, so what for you, how do you find the heads that you hunt? Where are you looking? Where is, where, how does that work for you? What's your process? Um, sure. So I work with a few different uh, resume searches. I've got um, uh, companies like um, Indeed. Uh, there's ZipRecruiter. There's Insurance Works. There's a few that I bounce around on sometimes, um, depending on uh, how much demand I have for candidates. Because some of the the searches can be quite expensive. So yeah. I only have a few searches, um, and you'll see the same candidates across all different platforms. 
So um, yeah, I use a few of those. I use LinkedIn quite heavily. Um, I think everybody then, does right now. Like I think yeah. LinkedIn is kind of the gold yeah. standard. Exactly. And then I've got a small database uh, of candidates that I'll check in with every now and then just to say, hey, how are things going? I know you said you mentioned you might be looking in the future. You wanted to get this certification. Did you get it? So I do have a few that I just follow up with and see how they're doing um, and if they're ready to start searching as well. So, so I know that some recruiters do and people I find that candidates that I work with believe that recruiters do a lot more of than my experiences they do. They shop candidates. So they'll be like, hey, Susie is really great. I'm going to call five insurance companies and be like, hey, wouldn't you like to hire Susie? Is that something that you find right now actually is working? Is that something that you do very much? Is that a yeah, realistic no, expectation? Yeah, I probably have three really top candidates right now that are all looking. It's tough uh, just because of what's going on in the world and also because of the holidays. Um, but uh, come January, I'll be able to do it a little bit heavier. Um, but yeah, I have about three candidates um, that are all really good candidates. One I've actually worked with before. She just happens to be moving. So I'm more than happy to help her again because her the, 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 the client I placed her with has nothing but good things to say about her. So I don't actually have a job where she's moving. So I'll have to go hunting uh, for clients in that area. So you have both heads and villages. That's what I heard. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's uh, okay. Both, yeah, yeah. So if a candidate wants to get on your radar. Mm -hmm. So let's, and I feel like they're two really different things in terms of the people that you're gonna shop around and then the people that you're going to put forward. If I want to get on your radar as somebody who stand out in the pile, what what stands out to you from, a pers from like a resume perspective, from a profile perspective, what are you looking for? Okay, so on a resume, um, the more detail you can put in, the better. Nine page um, resume, bring it. Yeah. Dates are important. Okay. Um, it's always good to keep your resume updated because sometimes if I see a resume online that their last job was 2018 or 2017, to me that means you haven't been working. Okay. And a lot of clients don't want to talk to you if you haven't been in the industry for a couple of years. That means you probably, your license is about also expired. Um, so just keep your resumes up to date, put as much detail in there, let me know which um, certifications you have, let me know which platforms you're aware of, like if it's, if it's just Microsoft Word or Microsoft platforms, okay, but if there's a special software for the industry you're in, definitely uh, let me know that, that's because I can search on all of that, so that pops up. Yeah, well, and, so, and that's one of the things that we keep telling everybody right now is that it's 2020, no one is in an office, yes. <laughs> right? So everything is virtual. And so more than ever, the technology aspect is important for roles that you wouldn't even think of. So like I was working with a client the other day who is an admin and she was like, I mean, I know office. I was like, no, no, you don't understand. <laughs> yeah. It's 2020, they wanna know, can you use Zoom? Can you use Teams? Can you use all of those video and, you know, distancing functionality that are part of the new modern working world? And I think yeah. that like going forward, the technology stuff is so important. I know for me, I'm always a big believer and I hate those lists of technologies. You know, the ones I'm yeah. talking about. Oh, I'm like, I don't care. Like that tells me nothing. You've made a big list for me. I don't know where you used it. I don't know how often. Right. I always really like to see everything with context. So yeah. if you're going to tell me, I really know, you know, at Salesforce, fantastic. Because why? Right. Because where did you use it? And like, I always want to see that actually tied to an employer with like, some engagement used Salesforce to generate X number of leads weekly or whatever. Exactly. Um, yeah. And is that like, I feel like that's kind of what you're, what you're yeah, saying 100%, as well. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Let us know where, when you've used it. If you, if, if you use Salesforce 10 years ago, it's not as valid <laughs> as you using Salesforce just last year at your oh. most current employer. And uh, so, yeah, like the most detail um, with all the jobs. And one thing that I have noticed, and I won't, generally contact a lot of um, candidates that repeat their qualifications if they've had like three jobs in the last 10 years but they all say the same description 
Yes. I generally won't. Yeah, I generally won't talk to them. You just, just think you, you did not do this. Oh, I know. Oh, totally. Yes. Yeah. Those people, if you are, for me as a recruiter, laziness in your resume writing yeah. says laziness in your work habits. Yeah. And that was just super, super off-putting. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I mean, and I think that like we have people that have contacted us in the past and they're like, well, I always assumed that the recruiter was going to rewrite my resume for me. What what message would you have for those candidates? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, <laughs> that's what we're doing here. We, we need you to sell yourself to us as well. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong. There's absolutely nothing wrong with showing your personality uh, on your resume. Even just have a little section, an about me section. Um, and I'll be honest, I've got two positions right now that are like less about the actual position. They are more than happy to train. They want to know if you're a cool person. Mm -hmm. so, so how do you, how do you like, obviously comic sans font and hot pink are not the path right. to achieving that. <laughs> so what is it that you, what do you want? Do you want to bring back that old like hobbies and interests section and have them tell you that they cross stitch with their grandma or like, what do you, um, how do you want that to look? Yeah. Um, so yeah, tell me a little bit about your interests. You don't have to go into huge detail. It can be very point form, very like brief as if just a quick summary. Um, you know, you can tell me any little thing just to make yourself pop out and it can be on the professional side, something funny. Um, you know, I'm usually the one in the office that really gets people going, like, you know, like how you bring to the table a certain atmosphere, you know, just tell me a little bit about yourself that you can add on to other than just, here's my piece of paper with what I can do. Tell me a little yeah. bit. About yeah. So. And we, one of the things I think that helps for me and that we try to do in our resumes, especially for people in leadership roles, mm -hmm. is if you are the funny person, like if you think you're funny, I know I do, um, and like you lead meetings and that kind of stuff with a sense of humor, say that. And I think that for me as a recruiter, A, it feels a little bit bold, but still professional. And B, I think that it really says something about you. Do you know what I mean? Like if you put in there like lead scrum weekly with sense of adventure and fun and incorporating humor into decks, blah, blah, blah. Like that just creates some kind of a picture of what's sitting in that daily stand up. Yeah, <laughs> you're, you're, yeah you're absolutely, you're, you're obviously saying I make my, you want to be in my meetings. Yes, yes, you know, absolutely. So that's absolutely incredible to add. Okay, so religious argument here. Mm -hmm. Cover letters, love them, hate them, don't care. Uh, love them. Really? Because sometimes you're that person. You're yeah. the one. <laughs> this is where that creativity can come out in a cover letter. If you're not okay. sure where it fits in properly to a resume, mm -hmm. tell me about, about yourself in a cover letter. Sell yourself there. Okay. Okay. So, which is fascinating. So the reason I said it's religious argument, I'm sure you know. Tons of recruiters are like, I never open cover letters. Why do you spend your life writing cover letters? I'm not uh -huh. going to read them. And my argument is that, and by all means, tell me if you disagree, this is opening for debate. Sure. But my argument is that I always read the email to which your resume is attached. So if you treat that email as a cover letter, I'm going to read it. Right. If you have two attachments, one of which is a labeled cover letter and one of which is labeled resume, I am never going to open that cover letter document. I'm going to right. open the resume document only. Yeah. And I'm almost assuming sometimes that cover letter is copied and put into the email. Oh, you'd be surprised. But yeah, yes. So, and that's that's 100% yeah. fine too. But when you just, uh, again, if you blindly send me a resume with not really a whole lot of description in the email, that's where a cover letter helps. Otherwise, just copy and paste. I really don't care if it comes in a letter, in an email. It just helps. Well, I, 
I have to say, I have already learned because I knew that there were recruiters out there. People tell me, oh, I've spoken to recruiters that say that they're a really big deal. And I, I did not personally know one. So Melissa, thank you for, <laughs> for representing what is in my experience, you know, the minority at this point, but it reinforces that yes, the work we do for our clients, writing cover letters is still important. So that actually makes me feel kind of better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Cause we, yeah, we put a lot into those cover letters and I'm like, nobody's ever going to read this. But now I know you yes. are going to absolutely read it. Yeah. So one of the questions that everybody always wants to know for all of our guests is how much do you make? We never expect you to give us a number. That would be gauche. <laughs> um, how do you respond when people ask that? Um, it's it's the type of job where you have to have a lot of patience. Um you're, you're going to have ups and downs. Some months you're not going to make anything and other months you're going to make everything you needed for the last two months. Um, you know, I try to keep my commission percentage on placements a little below the competition because I don't have a whole lot of overhead. It's just me, so I can. Um, but yeah, it, it can be really good money, but it can also some months you're, you, you panic. It's feast and famine, absolutely. 100%, yeah, and so, yeah, I mean, when you have your good months, then you can kind of take a breather. You can kind of, okay, I'm good for the next couple of months. There's not as much pressure. You still want to make those placements and, and, and keep making yeah. money, but uh, again, yeah, it can be really good money, um, but it's not always good money, so. Yeah, I, you know, I worked uh, for years for the largest recruitment company in the world, um, and they, we had, they had a handful of people that had feast every month that had those like super enormous clients that were yeah. always hiring at really high volume. And like, you know, they were making high six figures and it was consistent and great. They were so much the exception to the rule that it yeah. was ridiculous, but they were the people that got all the press, right? Because it's the... It's like how Vegas loves a winner, right? <laughs> right. You, <laughs> you know, want to make right. a big deal about the people who are like, oh, if you do great in recruitment, you can make all this money. And I love recruitment. I love talent acquisition. I really genuinely, like in my heart of hearts and deep in my bones, I love this industry. But I also get really frustrated with people trying to sell it as something it's not. Yeah. So like, I think... I've seen so many people setting up shop in 2020 as like, I could be a recruiter. I was in HR for a hot minute and I helped fill like some bulk, but I'm like, that is not the same girlfriend. No, no. <laughs> You're not. This is, so talk to me a little bit about that. Like what is the distinguishing if as a company, I was looking to hire a headhunter, mm -hmm. what should I look for? What makes a great headhunter? What makes somebody who worked in HR for a hot minute and now thinks right. that they should be a headhunter? Um, well, I tend to really relate to a lot of my clients. Um, I try to take the personal approach. I try not to make it all business. I want to learn about their employees, how things are going. Uh, I, I, I loved going to visit the, the actual brokers themselves just to see what it looks like so I can really sell the place myself um to to any potential candidates um it's 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 really not the most glamorous job you really have to have a stomach for it um Art. and if you're the kind of person that just thinks i can do this it's easy it's easy you really have to have you have a lot of heart but you have to remember you're also dealing with humans mm -hmm. and that human factor is tough especially when there's families involved in making the decision. Should I change jobs? Should I not? And the last minute, when you think you've got a deal done, and then the candidate says, no, I feel safe. I, I'm just not going to move. You have to be able to mentally handle that. And yeah, it, it, it's, it's, it's tough. It, it's not a glamorous job. It's not easy by any means. It does cost money. Um, the, the search, these resume search websites are not cheap. Um, so, I mean, if you're going to get into it, you really have to be dedicated to it. I think the other thing that people, I don't know, I guess discount is how much you have to have been around a couple blocks yeah. to be any good because a big part of what you do is give advice to everybody involved, right? So the hiring managers ask you, 
well, what do you think? Where is the market sitting right now? Is this, and you have to be able to turn around and be like, friend, I want to tell you right now, you are never going to get anybody, you're not going to get the candidate that you want for your price bracket. Exactly. So you, you got two choices. You can increase your price or you can alter your candidate expectation. Yep. But you are not going to get nine years of experience with a plucky attitude and green hair who wants to live in your tiny remote village <laughs> right? <laughs> for and a 30% below market. Like that's not a thing. Yeah. And, that, and it's tough to tell your clients you're being a little too cheap or you're asking a bit too much that that person just really doesn't exist for if you want to give me six months to a year i might be able to track them down but if you need them tomorrow you're you're asking too much well and then at that point if it's going to take me six months to find them could you not have grown one in six months could you not take somebody here that six months from now with some training and coaching would be there and you know what i mean like that for me was always the thing that was mystifying with, with yes. clients was that there's this perception that we're going to dig our heels in today, that they have to have this skill set the moment they walk in the door. And that in order to get there, we're going to be six months down the road. Well, whereas I, there's a lot you can teach somebody in six months. <laughs> yeah. You can Very grow awesome. a lot of hard, especially if it's a hard skill issue. Yep. Like that's a lot you can do. Um, so yeah, I, I've always just found that so bizarre. And I think the other part is obviously the advice that candidates expect. Yes. Candidates come and they're like, oh, well, you know, should I ask this? Should I ask that? Should I do this, that, and the other? And in recruitment, I know I, it was always kind of, I'm a control freak. Yeah. <laughs> truth telling moment here, <laughs> total control freak. So I was absolutely that recruiter that was there 13 hour days because I personally did every single thing for a deal. I personally went through and like zhuzhed the resume <laughs> for every candidate I put forward. And then I personally like coached them on uh, interviews and talked to, this is exactly what you can do, blah, blah, blah. And it's really diminishing returns really fast. Like you just, you know what I mean? Like when you've got five requirements that you're working on right now and each one has five candidates, you know, that's 25 people. You don't have time yeah. to do all of that for each one. Cause ultimately you only have two arms, two legs, one brain in 24 hours. So right. yeah. um, what for you, if you could give, if you could make one request of all of your candidates for future, what would your one super request of all candidates going forward be? Of all candidates, oh gosh, um, yeah, be that's honest a... with me, be honest. Um, if you don't know something, I'd rather tell the client, hey, listen, I've got a really good candidate. She's really good in this area, but she she's honest in telling me she's she's not quite up to snuff here and could use the training. If you're willing to train her, she's more than happy to take this kind of job. But don't make it sound like you can do everything because not everybody can do everything. Just be 100% honest. And also be honest about where you are. If you are not 100% about a job, yeah. just tell your yeah. recruiter. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah. What is your thought on counter offers? When should somebody accept a counter? Um, the counter offers are tricky because sometimes and a lot more lately, I found that candidates are only using recruiters in order to get the counter offers. So while you're doing all this work, trying to get them into a good job, all they're trying to do is get an offer letter from somewhere else to take to their current employer and say, Hey, listen, I got more money here. Can you do better? And that's the heartbreaking part when you've done all that work. And then the yeah. counter offers come up. You have to really like let them consider your, you know, your empl your employer wasn't going to give you this unless you went and threatened right. them. That's the thing for me. I have my advice has always been. I think one of like the first how to be a recruiter seminars that one of the companies I went for sent me to, like you know where they send you to like I've been in sales for a thousand years. I know all the things. Those kind of deals. That was one of the pieces of advice that they gave. Like you should never accept a counter offer. And it just, Melissa, it just resonated with me. And it has been 
my tried and true advice for my personal life, for my friends, my family, my clients, everybody. Never accept a counter offer. Yeah. If you had to threaten them yeah. to get that. Yeah. If you couldn't approach them in the first place without going with that down that road. And like if you approached them already, they said you we're not giving you a raise. Yeah. Don't be searching for the counter because yeah. If you only get what you need yeah. by threatening, yes. then this is like you're going to be in the same position a little bit further down the line. And yeah. if you're leaving for a reason other than just money, yeah. they're going to make a lot of promises if they're scared. Exactly. Yeah. What are they on? I, I, in all my years, I could probably count on my hands the number of times that promises made in the counter stuck. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And not because the, the employer was evil or, but because you have established patterns with yeah. them and it's so easy to revert right back into those patterns. Yeah. And honestly, one time in my own professional life, I did not take my own advice. I took the counter offer and stayed and Melissa. <laughs> Within like three weeks, we were right back to yeah. Work yeah. before I, I had done. And so, yeah, absolutely. Like I, that for me is such just a never, ever, ever accept a counter. Yeah. yeah. And, and on the other side of the desk, I always tell my, so part of what I do is I help clients create recruitment packages. And I always tell them don't counter. Right. Why would you? Why are you gonna pay them more? If they weren't worth that yesterday, why are they worth it today? Exactly, yep. Yeah. So just say bye and then let's find somebody that does wanna be here. Right, exactly, yep. Yeah. Now, yeah, the counter offer is the tough, the tough one. Oh, I hate it. I just hate <laughs> it. I wish everyone would stop. Yes. And <laughs> <laughs> um, what do you think in terms of things that you hear about your industry, about your role, et cetera, what do you think is probably the biggest myth about headhunters or recruiters that's out there right at the second? Um, so I think that the idea that we're all the same, um, okay. and I was actually recruited by a recruiting company while I was with my previous recruiting company. <laughs> and uh, I, I went in and I was, I was kind of shocked at their model of doing things. And I'm like, if I was one of your clients, I would not be happy how you operate. Tell me more about that. What, what was shock? Um, just not lying about candidates, um, fluffing them up to be something they're not. Um, and then again, shoving resumes, shoving any kind of resume at them just to say- You're throwing it gonna... against the wall and hoping something yeah, like sticks. I got 80, 80, 10 resumes today. Well, yes. you know, the reason they're hiring you as a headhunter is to sift through those 10 resumes. And if there's none, there's none. If there's one, there's one. But they don't want to be sifting through. They are expecting you to come up with the magical person in that stack. And if it's not there, don't send anything. But I think a lot of people, especially a lot of companies around uh, where I'm at here in Toronto, um, they're, they're burned by a lot of recruiting companies. There are a lot around here and I hear the same thing from all of them. Um, a lot of them are just sending resumes to send them and they're not getting quality ca candidates at all. I do pre-screens for all of my people and I insist that uh, my clients also do at least one interview, preferably in person. Sometimes lately it's a little bit harder for that. Um, but I, I insist that, you know, what I see on a resume and hear on the telephone during a phone uh, pre-screen may not be what they see. So, you know, it's always good to compare notes afterwards. So, yeah, but yeah. Um, I, I don't want to be that high pressure recruiter because that's what's burning a lot of clients. That's why they don't even want to use recruiters or headhunters anymore. So, so a few years ago, um, I was, so I, I, lit, I worked and recruited in the UK for a number of years and, um, so in about, I think, 2012, a statistic came out that said that in any given week, HR in the UK got 200 unsolicited phone calls from recruiters yeah. selling their services. I'm like, I can't even imagine. Yeah. Hanging up on recruiters is like a full-time job. 
exactly. That's insane. And so I think like, but I think that that's where that like high pressure, you know, throwing stuff against the wall, like once they find someone, they're so desperate to, yeah. to keep it and fill it that they, they quit doing a great job. Like yeah. my take was always that I, um, I only send three resumes. I only send three. Yeah. And when you tell me, when you and I have talked through those three and I know yes, no, and why on yeah. each one, then we can talk about three more, yeah. but I only, because one, I mean, that could be a fluke. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, so exactly. I felt like three was the number that it took for me to really make sure that I understood. And, you know, I've worked for companies that are like, we send five resumes within 24 hours. Why and how? Yeah. Like, no, what? How can you know that? Like, if I have some crazy requirement and, you know, I specialize in IT and engineering. Some of the roles I was recruiting for, there are not five people. <laughs> You're hundred percent right. Yeah. It, like that, that is, I think the misconception too, that when clients take us on, they think we have stacks and stacks of people just waiting for jobs, which is not the case. We have stacks and stacks of people. Sure. But none of them that are going to fit the bill. And exactly. usually it's such a specialized requirement and um, it's going to take a little time to find that person. Absolutely. Absolutely. And especially like you said, you, if, if we're really doing our job as recruiters, because if we're doing our job as recruiters, their job as a hiring manager is both easier and harder because they only get three candidates, but they're fabulous. And so yeah, exactly. they, their yeah. job is picking, you know, the best of an awesome lot as opposed to sifting through all of the applicants. Yeah. So right now when you are, do you post roles or do you, uh, Okay, so when you post a role right now, about how many applicants are you getting for your roles, given that they're fairly niche, they're insurance sector, how many applicants are you looking at in general? Um, not many. Okay. Not many. A lot of um, candidates, They, I mean, and yes, I, I hunt them, I, I do hunt, um, but a lot of candidates are uh, under the impression that I'll find them. Okay. Yeah. And... Um, that part is tough. And I, I, I see resumes online and I see clients job postings online and the job posting, the, the clients think the candidate is going to find them. The candidate thinks the client's going to find them, which is when that's when you need the headhunter to bring it together. Um, so, which is yeah. amazing when you have, you know, you're hearing at the same time, millions of people looking for work you would expect that any job post is just being inundated with applicants. Yeah. And, and here you are as a recruiter saying, please, somebody apply for my jobs. Exactly. <laughs> and I think, I think the, the, um, the, what I find the most is I find a lot of um, candidates for overseas are trying, that are trying to move to Canada are the ones right. that are always applying. And I'm like, okay, well, you, unfortunately, you have to have been in the industry in Canada for several yeah. years. You have to have your licenses here in Canada. If you don't have that, I'm sorry. I there's nothing I can do for you, and I apologize for that. But uh, um, yeah, no, I don't get inundated with applicants. Okay. Any, yeah. <laughs> so when so there's a lot of work that needs to be done in terms of candidate yeah. management and understanding in that regard. Yeah. Awesome. Well, we are about out of time. Do you have any? last pearls of wisdom to share uh, before we go? I, um, I feel like I've learned a lot in this conversation. I'm excited. So yeah, no, I think the biggest thing is uh, on the client side, just be understanding. Um, you know, if you can take on uh, somebody that is new to the industry, newly licensed, and you have the time to train them, do it because there's some amazing personalities out there that just need to get their foot in the door. If you can help them out, they will, they can do amazing things. They don't have to have 10 years experience and you can train and mold them the way you want. That's the benefit of taking somebody new. And then also like on the candidate side, just be honest and show your personality. It's, it's the best way you're gonna find the job. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time and all of your wisdom and sharing. I really appreciate it. Uh, we will have links to Melissa and her company if you want to apply directly to her. Obviously, she's actively seeking for uh, candidates. What sort of skill sets are you looking for at the moment, Melissa? 
Um, right now, anybody with an Ontario Rebo uh, in, in license uh, to sell insurance is amazing. A lot of the outskirts of the Toronto area, Ottawa, everybody's, there are a lot of companies hiring right now, even through COVID. So, um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So anybody in that area, uh, look at Melissa. And like I said, we'll have links to her and everything else. Thank you so much for joining us. If you need help with any of the things that she and I talked about with your resume, with interviews, with job search approach, uh, ONH is here to help you with all of that. Thanks, everybody. Um, and happy holidays and happy new year uh, from, from ONH. And hey, I want your job. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. You've been listening to Hey, I Want Your Job. For more on how you can get your own awesome job, visit ONH Consulting at www.onhconsulting.com. We offer incredible resumes, no-nonsense career advice, and real-world tips for landing a job in today's market. Check us out on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram for more insider info. Soon you'll be hearing us say, I'm Morgan McBride, and I want your job. And I'm Lydia Lunning, and I want your job. And I'm Michelle Olivier, and hey, I want your job.